Hey everybody, welcome to the Blender Report, where news meets rational thinking. I'm your host, Jonathan Harvey. This is your co-host, Liam DeBoer. Liam, what's up, bro? Not too much. Today, we're going to be chatting about the Liberals claiming Polyev wants to rob Canadians by getting rid of the carbon tax, Andrew Tate being arrested and maybe being extradited to the UK, America officially passing a bill that could ban TikTok, and the European Union passing the world's first major act to regulate AI. However, if before we get into things, you wouldn't mind giving us a kind review on Spotify or subscribing to our YouTube channel wherever you're watching that would be greatly appreciated all right let's get started so first off we've got the Liberals claiming Polyev wants to rob Canadians by getting rid of carbon tax as Trudeau doubles down on his April hike the impending increase translates to a notable rise in costs for consumers, with gasoline set to surge by 17 cents per liter, diesel by 21 cents per liter, and natural gas by 15 cents per cubic meter. Despite harsh pushback, Trudeau responded, my job is not to be popular, as he doubled down on his April 1st carbon tax hike, citing the costly economic impacts of climate change. So why do you suppose Trudeau is pushing forward with the carbon tax despite mounting disapproval from just about everybody across the country yeah yeah so i'm not entirely sure why he's refusing to backpedal even a little bit here um because you know as he says it's not a popularity contest but the reality is yes it is that's all politics have become or a popularity contest you know what i mean uh if the guy wasn't decently good looking he would have never got into office so for, for me i'm not exactly sure why he's refusing to but one thing that i came across that was that was interesting on the UNESCO website, it actually says, the quiet part out loud, it says that Western governments are going to be, going to be collecting um, carbon tax so that they can cover the cost of a universal basic income. <laughs> it says it right on the website. It is insane. I could not believe it. I'm like, okay, well, this is starting to make sense. You know, he's increasing this. It's collecting, I don't know, it must be at around $10 billion a year now. Um, <clears throat> he's not really paying it out to the businesses yet. There's a two and a half billion dollar pot just sitting on the side there he restructured how he was paying businesses actually to take more from them and give more back in rebates um <clears throat> so i think what he could be doing is he's continuing to increase this and then what he wants he wants to do he wants to get people into the pattern of being used to getting their rebate so then what he does is once he continues with the carbon tax he cuts the rebates and goes right to ubi so people are already in the they're already in the the routine of giving money to the government paying this carbon tax and then receiving something and then when it gets high enough and he cuts that off i think it's an easier transition for him um that does probably sound a little conspiratorial i understand but it does say it right on the unesco website so and that makes sense when you look at all of these, these, um, you know, bureaucracies and stuff, whether it be the UNESCO, whether it be UN, whether it be the WEF, although I guess that's not quite technically a uh, bureaucracy. But if you look at all of these organizations, they, uh, they all point to the exact same things and they're all coordinating on the exact same agenda right so it is funny when you look at you call it a conspiracy it's like oh it's a conspiracy theory but you're like that's just what it is at this point it's a select group of people trying to push forward an agenda behind the eyes of the general populace yeah i mean otherwise the thing doesn't really make any sense right like i kind of broke this down when i was i was writing something yesterday and i was kind of like look if you understand how the tax works the intention is so that it curbs energy use, right? That's the idea. So it's not so much that they take the money and spend it on solving the climate problem. It's so that they penalize you into reducing your carbon footprint. That's the idea, right? But here's the thing. The, the, the lion's share of it is going to come from citizens. And the larger majority of it, other than how it, how it costs you money when you're buying groceries and other things like that, which I'll get into, um, the direct cost, though, is on heating your home and, and buying gasoline, right? The thing is, the average Canadian citizen can't reduce those things or they either can't afford to live or they're going to die. You know what I mean? If you don't heat your home and it's minus 20 out, well, you die. That's what happens. And if you don't put gas in your car, how do you get to work to pay for your heating bills? So it doesn't really, really make any sense, right? So then you kind of get into the idea of it being like, all right, well, you know, we will give you this rebate. And when you think about the rebate thing, they're like, well, their theory is we give you back more than you put in, which is a bit of a misdirection, obviously. But the reality is none of that actually makes any sense. You know, because if you're giving me back more than I'm putting in, 
well, why don't I just not put anything in? And why don't you just charge the businesses the net amount that they would be paying after their rebate that they're supposed to be getting and then disperse that to the citizens? Why don't you just do that? That's actually, see, that would be logical if you did want to implement a carbon tax. So this whole thing does not make any sense. They're doing this for another reason, to try to build a system and put something into place, which when you do look at the UNESCO website, it does start to make sense. Yeah. And there's a certain level of irony as well to sit there and say that uh, Polyev wants to rob Canadians by getting rid of a tax when taxation in and of itself is, is theft. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, it's it's a libertarian talking point, right, to say that taxation is theft. But if you really think about it, what other service or payment on planet Earth can be reinforced uh, supposedly legitimately by the threat of if you don't pay us it's actually like worse than threat in a sense or sorry than theft because th when theft happens somebody just comes around and robs you yeah this is like if you don't allow me to rob you i'm going to throw you in jail yeah it's really it's a lot worse <laughs> when we when we look at these kind of things on this level we see that how inefficient the government is with using these tax dollars, whether it be on services like healthcare, whether it be with things like the arrive can and so on. To your point, there's, there's a common saying as well, that the only way the government can distribute resources is through a leaky bucket. And you're like, Every time that something passes hands, it's going to lose some of its uh, its value, right? <laughs> Get stepped so, on. Yeah, so it's like you even have to create the bureaucracy in order to create these rebates or give these facilitate these rebates and yeah. such, right? So it's like you, right there, right then and there, you're already just leaking money. But that's the thing is that that's why this doesn't really make any sense. You can't you can't take money from people and then give them back more unless where, where's that surplus coming from, especially when you have all this overhead and all these other things that you're creating, like you said, the bureaucracy to sort of execute this plan. And we know there's we know how inefficient the government is. I'm sticking to this number of their efficiencies around 20 percent. Sounds about right. You know yeah. what I mean? So, I mean, the, the other issue that I have here when he's like, oh, well, they're Pierre is robbing Canadians by trying to take this rebate away. And it's like, look, by implementing this tax, obviously. People are, according to the the parliamentary budget office, the average government, pardon me, the average Canadian family is losing seven hundred dollars a year. So they're not doing well. But people are people like liberals. What they'll do, and I don't mean to attack liberals. That's not really my intention. But when you actually look at what this does, there is. If you look at a report from the government and from the Bank of Canada, they show exactly how much the carbon tax is contributing to inflation. So when you increase taxes for a business as the government. Well, the business actually has a lever they can pull, right? When they take more money out of your pocket and my pocket, you and I go, well, shit, what are we going to do, right? But if you have a business, what you do is you pull you pull an economic lever. What is, that, what is that lever? That lever is increasing your prices. Who pays the increased prices? Consumers. So it's it's driving inflation. It's, it's, it's increasing the cost of living across the board. And that's what I think a lot of people aren't catching here that are looking this as a, like looking at this as a very simple equation. They're going, well, if you're putting in a thousand, you're getting back 1200, then you're doing okay here. It's like, well, actually the cost of living has increased by X amount. And you know, and the thing is, is, and this is just continuing and continuing to increase. I also have my doubts about the direct return of capital being higher than what people are putting in. I'm not hundred percent sure on that yet. I don't have enough data to sort of corroborate or, or agree or disagree, but, um, to date, I don't really see anything strong that supports that this makes any sense. But to your point about pulling that economic lever in order to balance your bottom line, now we need to consider the fact that that happens across every single point in the supply chain yes. before a product gets to you, right? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's just a government racket. You know what I mean? Like, if, if, if Trudeau really wanted to do this and he wanted to execute this so that he could still give himself a pat on the back, then the only thing that makes sense, like, th look, when you look at any of these things, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with the carbon tax at all. If the government were to implement this and it were to make any sense at all, it would be exactly the way that I had said it, where you would charge businesses that have an economic lever to pull to afford the increase in the carbon tax because they're the only ones that can really manipulate their usage or make up the money to make or, or you know, I mean, make up the cost by charging consumers. If you do that, you just take the net amount you wouldn't give them a rebate for anything beyond that. This doesn't make any sense at all. It's just completely illogical. So obviously there's more to this than currently meets the eye. And I, th I think the UNESCO website, um, as much as I hate to say it, I think the UNESCO website is just sort of telling them where, where the future is going with this. Yeah, because, and that actually makes perfect sense there that you're, that, that they're laying it out as the funding for a universal basic income, because on a climate perspective, even if 
Like there's zero logic or reason that you can put into the idea that this is going to fix the climate when you consider the fact that China, who is over uh, responsible for roughly 30 percent of the world's emissions, has no carbon tax. Yeah. I mean, we're one of the few countries that has one. And then also on top of that, China is building two new coal plants per week. Yeah. So it's like, come on. Like what? What the hell are we doing here? It's it's just yeah. It's at this point, it's beyond doubt that this is just uh, this is just theft. Yeah, it's a government shakedown disguised as what I call a do-gooder tax. That's all it is, man. Yeah. All right. So moving on here, we've got Andrew Tate being arrested and maybe being extradited to the UK. So influencers Andrew Tate and his brother Tristan were detained in Romania on a British arrest warrant and could be uh, extradited later on, multiple outlets reported. The court decided Tuesday to grant the extradition, extradition request, but only after the Romanian legal proceedings are finished, according to the Associated Press. The brothers face allegations of sexual aggression dating back to 2012 to 2015 in the UK. Uh, Tate's lawyer praised the Romanian court's decision and said it provides an opportunity for the brothers to participate fully in their defense. So will much come of this or do you think it is just a scare tactic? It looks similar to what happened last time. It looks like they're just... I, obviously governments um, in the West don't like this guy. And he's got a lot of popularity and has a... And, you know, at the end of the day, like, he's able to sort of persuade a lot of people, you know, and, and I don't agree with a lot of things he says. Actually, I don't listen to him that often, but I would say probably 75% of the time he opens his mouth, I'm like, dude, shut the fuck up. Like, really? But 25%, I'm like, hey, that's a really, really great point. He is really intelligent, um, and he is persuading a lot of people to do things that seems that the government's not a huge fan of. I think especially when they're trying to go through this, um, they're working to, I know I, I don't want to go too far down this line, but like, we live in a world where they're trying to make everybody um, one thing. And this guy's really pushing this male masculinity stuff. So if, you're, if your intention is to sort of, <clears throat> sort of mold everybody into one sort of species where toxic masculinity, men can't be men and women can also be men, and you're kind of blurring these lines, and you have this guy that's on the forefront really screaming like masculinity, you know, take that back and be that guy. I can see how he's a problem for them. I understand. Um, at the end of the day though, I don't think anything's going to come of this. I think he's going to be, they're just continuing to drag his name through the mud. You know what I mean? Which in fairness, he kind of does himself because he says a lot of dumb shit. Like just let the guy sink his own ship. But uh, that that doesn't seem to be the case. So I think that he'll end up uh, in this case probably for the next couple of years and it's going to make him look shitty in the media and whatever whatever else he's doing. Uh, but at the end of the day, honestly, I don't think he's he's really done much wrong in this case. Yeah, I don't know much about the criminal aspect. My whole thought there is just let's just see where it goes, see how see how things shake out. I don't I'm not going to sit here and say whether he's guilty or innocent. What I do find interesting about this whole uh this whole t topic and conversation though is that on one hand, there's just so much there's there's hypocrisy from all sides. So on one hand, you've got Andrew Tate sitting there saying he loves and respects women, how precious they are and all of this, but then made his early day fortunes off of uh, selling their bodies on online yeah. there through through webcam services, right? And then you look at the so there's there's the hypocrisy from his side. And then on the other aspect, you've got the the left wing side of politics saying how toxic he is, how he is this sexual aggressor and so on, but then simultaneously championing the fact that things like OnlyFans and porn and sex work and all this kind of things are female empowerment. Right. So I'm just like, I see it's just... It doesn't actually on either side. It doesn't line up with their with their visions of how these things go. Um, and this is I see when you play these things out in reality. If you want to create a world where these things are looked at as normalized career paths, it's like this is how it's going to shake out. Yeah, you're going to have essentially ringleaders like Andrew Tate recruiting girls and then selling them online in order to. Uh, in order to make their their buck and it's like that's it's essentially online pimping so <clears throat> i have an interesting story i when i was young i was in my early 20s um i used to work in the porn industry <laughs> so uh, <laughs> um 
So I was, I was, I worked in marketing and sales for a company called Python and dollar machine. They were the biggest or like top three biggest porn companies in the world, online porn. Um, my wife sitting also across my, the table yeah. from the devil. <laughs> it was funny. Uh, it was great, man. I got to travel around, go to all these porn conventions. They were wild, wild, like as crazy as you'd think they'd rent out the entire hotel and there's just naked people everywhere. You're like, where the fuck am I, dude? I remember one time I was in Vegas and I was in like the play one playboy suite or something. And in the suite, there was bowling alleys and basketball courts. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I'm in my early twenties. I'm like, this is wild. <laughs> this is, it was insane. Uh, a lot of fun, <clears throat> good money in the business. And it was kind of the wild west back then. Right. My my point in saying this is the guy that owned the company at the time, his name was David Vanderpool, really nice guy, um, Dutch dude. Um, but my, my point is there are thousands of these guys that owned these companies back then. This is what they did. They made tons of money doing this, right? And you're saying Andrew Tate did the same thing. None of these other guys are under scrutiny. None of these other guys are getting in any trouble. None of these guys are on anybody's radar I, for, for, for that, for that specifically. So again, I look at this and I kind of go, well, He's doing the same thing a lot of other people did. And what's happening is the government is using that as an excuse to attack him because they don't like what he represents. So I think they're just, that's, that's the, you look at it and you kind of point out the hypocrisy, but the reality is they're just using whatever ammo they have to try to pin the guy to the wall. Yeah. Yeah. The, his, his influence is undeniable. And that, I think that is what's getting this target painted on his back for sure. Um, and it does seem like these are the typical allegations that get thrown up at somebody whenever you don't like what they have to say we saw it happen with russell brand not much seemed to come out of that yeah although whatever these are legal proceedings so they take a long time to unfold right but i think what's crazy in regards to this kind of stuff is we've now entered this world of public opinion well i say we've entered this world but i think maybe it's always been this way it's just blown up to greater proportions because of a, the internet but in the court of public opinion, you're not innocent till proven guilty. It's the other way around. Like these allegations get tossed at you and now that label sticks on you. Yes. And it's almost impossible to get away from. And in that, at that point, those people have got what they wanted. They have slandered your name. They have tarnished it, whether it be legitimate or not. Yep. And then the other, there was, a, there was an interesting concept that I, I heard a guy named Destiny talk about. He called it the all roads lead to Rome theory that people, when things unfold, you end up at your desired position no matter what. So let's say Andrew Tate doesn't get found guilty on these charges. The conspiracy crowd would say that, well, yeah, that's because he was never guilty in the first place. And to assume that those court judgments are accurate, you're now assuming that those judges and everything were acting properly okay and then on the opposite end if he gets found guilty it's oh well those courts aren't acting appropriately right so you ha you have to kind of do some sort of mental gymnastics one way or another to get to that point of he's innocent mm -hmm. no matter no matter which way it ends up going and i just i just found that very interesting where it's like okay you'll you'll shift your perspective in order to fit that desired conclusion for sure i mean at the end of the day i don't really care if the guy's innocent or guilty other than if he negatively affected other people you know i feel bad for them i don't really care about his situation i just don't you know what i mean i don't think he gives a fuck about mine either <laughs> um uh but but that being said i just think like my my perspective on the issue is um this is an attack that's in you know what like they already pinned him once right so that makes this even easier they pinned him once they got nothing it didn't pay it didn't pan out for them and now they're going through it again which means they had time to sort of try to like they already had the opportunity and they failed once and now they're going back to some old cases from 2012 to 2015 that's gonna be hard to prove i'm not sure how this plays out for them i mean at the end of the day i just think that they're like you said they're taking this opportunity to slander him and to just try to distort or hurt his image any way that they can i think that they know People that support him are going to continue to support him, but I think they're making him look like more of a villain to the rest of the media and anybody on the left. I think that's their main goal. Um, but again, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. That's just sort of my perspective on it. Well, you also tarnish the people who support him by tarnishing him. So it's because now you're making them look like they're a sexual abuser apologist right. or whatever, right? Yeah, so that's actually a really good point. When you do stuff like that, you do probably persuade people on the fence, right? They go, well, I don't want to be associated with that. You know, people that would maybe appreciate his opinions once in a while. They go, well, well, you did this? Well, no, 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 I'm out, I'm out. So yeah, I mean, that's a good point. He probably would lose like 
At the end of the day, you never know how this works out. They do this to Trump. He becomes more popular. They did it to Joe Rogan. He becomes more popular. You know, you do this to Andrew Tate. He might lose 10% of his base, but it might grow by 25%. Who knows? But yeah, anyway, I guess, well, we'll see how it plays out. But, you know, to, to, to your question, um, I think it's, I think they're trumped up charges, to be honest. Okay, and the third story for the day, we've got America officially passing a bill that could ban TikTok. So the House of Representatives officially passed a bill that could significantly impact TikTok and other foreign-owned applications. This legislation stems from national security concerns, specifically the potential for these apps to be misused by foreign governments. The bill requires TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, which is based in China, to divest its ownership of the app within a set time frame. Failure to do so would result in a ban on the app within the United States. Additionally, the bill grants the president the authority to designate other social media applications as national security threats based on their ownership and potential for misuse. Dangerous, good step. What's what's your what's your feelings here? Ugh. So I, I kind of have two two thoughts on this. I see it sort of two different perspectives, I guess. Um, if you look at what TikTok is doing. And the other social companies may be doing the same, but you look at kind of what TikTok is doing to sort of um, take kids down the wrong path. You know, I, I remember watching this thing. I think it was on a Joe Rogan podcast. And the guy's like, yeah, I signed up for TikTok as a 13-year-old girl. Didn't engage with anything. And then almost immediately, there was things on there about self-harm and your image and all this other stuff. So they just go, oh, a 13-year-old girl from America? Cool. Here's what we're going to send them. So you can see how immediately that takes them down a bad path. Um, and, then, and then you look at sort of Look at all these challenges these kids are doing. Kids are dying doing these things. It's wild. You know, you get them doing a lot of this stupid shit. There's a lot of this, you know, I have a buddy, I have a buddy back home uh, whose kid, and I, I never really knew anything about this, but like he was, I guess kids cut themselves. I had no idea what that was about. I guess he picked it up off of TikTok and it's about, I don't know, maybe victimizing themselves. I'm not going to go too deep into it. I don't know, but I know that's kind of where it spawned for him. Um, you, you, so you, you look at what these things, what this, this app is doing to these kids and you kind of go, yeah, this is a bit of a mess. Like, it would be good for us to do something about it. Is it necessarily on the government to take charge and to make the company divest so that someone in America can own it so that they can own the data? I'm not sure that's the best solution, but you see how TikTok um, works in China and it's actually a lot more advantageous for kids. They have a limited amount of time, a lot of it's educational content. So if you look at it, it's kind of, it is kind of a psyop. Like, they are doing it to deteriorate society in America, for sure. However... I'm not necessarily sure this piece of legislation is the best way to deal with it for a couple of reasons. First, in America, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, these other companies have not shown that they are doing a lot better for people. The other thing is he's given himself power to do the same thing with other social media companies. Now, it says that it has to do with um, based on ownership and potential for misuse as it, as it, as it pertains to national security. That's a really interesting broad term to use right because right now what is the government saying in america they're saying in canada too this shit's pissing me off this 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 presidential election if you don't vote for the right party we're gonna lose democracy what are you talking about the fact that you get to vote means you have a democracy what are you saying it's so idiotic it drives me fucking insane but the thing is if they think that if you vote for trump or you know people say if you vote for biden it's you're gonna you're gonna lose democracy um, first of all, that doesn't make any sense, but if that's the way you, if that's what you believe, if that's your narrative, and now you've got these social media platforms allowing Republican perspectives, is that now a threat to national security? How does that work out now? Now can the government just, so there's something going through the Supreme Court right now about free speech on, on social. That's going to shake out. We'll see how that goes. But if you give Biden this power, does that even matter anymore? Because you'll go, oh no, no, you can't have any of this stuff because here's how this is going to work. If you don't take all that content down, this is a national security issue you need to sell. You need to get rid of this. This needs to be divested. And then here's what they're going to do. They are going to nationalize this shit. The government's going to go, we need to own it. It just needs to be ours. It'll be easier for everybody. If we get to, so, so for me, sorry, I'm a little frazzled. It, it, it really frustrates me. Um, I think this is a very dangerous first step down a very dark path. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And it's that, it's that widening of what is considered national security. And even just, I have an issue with this whole concept of, infringing on freedom in the name of security because without that freedom you're not secure <laughs> anyways right. so it's it's like you can't do one thing to solve an issue while your proposed solution actually infringes on the issue that you are saying you're trying to solve 
and we've seen this before whether it be like these kind of things where you know post the patriot act post 9 11 it was okay well we need the ability to spy on everybody's calls cell phones uh text messages emails everything be able to look at webcams live as the computers are open all of this kind of stuff we're doing it for your good it's it's for your safety and i look at that and go it's probably a lot better characterized as the state's safety and what's best for the state isn't always what's best for the people and sometimes those those incentives can align i don't think they do often but yeah it's very rare that they do and i think these are just those those issues where they don't want whether it be foreign or national uh, like domestic they don't want any questioning of their narratives and you've seen this with things like that do go viral on uh tiktok with those osama bin laden letters uh yeah. and, and everybody and them pushing it out almost as a, as a good thing and that does like this is that is ideological subversion in a sense you know we've talked about it before we're in what's called fifth generation warfare which is psychological manipulation essentially and this so this i look at tiktok very much as a weapon but yeah i i, I see this being it's really hard to not see this as an impossible scenario because on one hand yeah you've got an immense an immense threat from TikTok in China and on the other hand you've got an immense threat from your own governments for dealing with their threats. Well, the problem is they've passed this. Yeah. So they've passed this and basically what this says is they have got like TikTok or ByteDance rather has a set amount of time, I'm not sure what that is exactly, to divest the company. So the government's in a win-win situation and the citizens are in a lose-lose situation. The other thing that we didn't really touch on is like how many people make their their living off TikTok? There's like, you and I don't, like I think I've got 40,000 followers on TikTok. If I paid attention, I could make good money on that platform. I mean, I'd have to do a lot more on there, but with that, just with 40,000 people, people have millions, people have hundreds of thousands, people's businesses depend on it. You know what I mean? Like the, the your, your ability to market on that platform and sell something on Amazon is phenomenal. So it's like, the other thing too, is they're also, this is, this is gonna be really hard on a lot of citizens and a lot of businesses. Like the ramifications of this, I mean, I would bet, I don't know. I, I, I would venture to bet that 100 million people in America have TikTok. And I would guess that like maybe 2% of those people are making a good living off of it. So that's 2 million Americans. You're affecting a lot of business and a lot of people, right? And I, I just don't know, like, you know, I, I realize that it's, you know, you don't own the platform, so that can be taken away at any time. But when your government's the one doing it, like what, what kind of, what kind of situation does that create for you? So this, again, like the citizens, no matter what, the citizens lose here and the government wins regardless. And I think it just gives them overbearing power on something that's just going to be so much worse down the line because you know that this is, like you said, this is just going to set a precedent where this is going to get a lot worse when it comes to companies like Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with, with Elon. Like he's like Mr. Free Speech. Like where's that going to go? Because that's going to be a threat to national security in no time. Yeah, all, all of the people that are supporting these acts are also exactly characterizing Twitter and Elon Musk as a traitor or a threat to, yeah, democracy, all of these kind of things. Here's a question, you know, and I'm not I'm not a fan of jumping to government regulation as the end all and be all. And I, I think we're overregulated, if anything. But if you were going to regulate this as they're trying mm -hmm. or as they've successfully done in a sense now, what would be a better step forward in terms of regulation? Like, do you think you could actually maybe make it so that these social media platforms would have to open source their out like their algorithms so that everybody can kind of see what's under the hood? I think I think that would probably be a more like I mean you could you could argue that infringes on their competitive ability. Yeah. But at the same time, then you really get to see how they're pushing these things. And that way you're not the government isn't able to change how they're doing things or infringe on on their abilities but everybody is then able to look at them and go what are you actually really doing here i think at the end of the day the solution is retrain your citizens because here's what's going to happen people are addicted the number one job people want as uh in gen z by like 55 percent, i think is to be an influencer when you look down at uh, millennials and i think even gen x i think that number is around 40 percent that's the number one job people want. So if you take away TikTok, something is going to take its place. 
That is exactly what's going to happen. If you tell me exactly what's going on on these platforms, all I'm going to do is cater my content more to it. That's what I'm going to do because it'll give me an opportunity to be more successful. It's not going to change people's addiction or people's use of these platforms. If you take TikTok away, something will take its place. That's just how this is going to go. The only way that you resolve this problem is at home, is teaching individuals and society to behave differently. That's what we have to do. There is no other way around it because like, Unless you cut social media altogether, which is an impossibility, you just need people to fucking smarten up, right? Like, I don't, I don't see any other way around it because, like, there is no, there is no, there is no fix here. There is no fix because no matter what you do, someone else is going to create the next TikTok. It doesn't matter what they have to show you. It doesn't matter if they, if they have to open the hood. It does not make a difference. People want this. They want, they want the popularity. They want the fame. This, they want this to be their job. This is how they want to live their life. It does not matter. So for me, this is... Bandit on a broken leg. To me, this is just the government taking more power and bullying China on something. And again, I don't really agree with TikTok and what it's doing to society. But again, I just can't really, I don't think putting it in the government's hands is the solution. And I don't think really necessarily blaming TikTok is the right thing to do either because you've also got Instagram, you've got Twitter, you've got all these other outlets to do the same thing anyway. It's, it's just where society's head is at. That's what needs to change. Yeah, I agree with you, but fuck, it's hard to, it's hard to change people's behavior that way like everybody is very easy to prey on in terms of psychological manipulation, whether it even just be from a marketing standpoint, whether it be from these social media companies being able to hack people's brains essentially in order to get them addicted to scrolling and such. Like I've had to put, I put a thing on my phone recently over the last probably month or two that's extremely helpful. It's an app that blocks your ability to get into whatever apps you set but you can set how many times a day you want to go into them. So I'm like, okay, I can go into social media apps three times a day. Uh, and then you get to set how much time you want for each of those times. So I'm like, okay, I get five minutes and that gives me enough to log in, post the things that we need to post or for my other clients yeah. and such, and then get the hell out. And, but it is crazy because I have to take those steps, even knowing that I'm even somebody that's completely aware of how these things operate. I can just as easily be like, okay, head into my messages. Oh, this person sent me this meme. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm down a rabbit hole. And then you pop out and you're like, holy shit, 15 minutes later, where did that just go? It's like, how, how do you get that message across to people though? Like without, cause, cause we say you need to retrain people, but it's like, how do you, that, oh, you have to, like, there's, yeah. look, there's no other way around it. It's like any kind of technology that enters the market. There's this sort of adoption phase. And unfortunately humans were like little babies with social media right now. We've not figured it out. We don't really know our own limits. We don't really know the boundaries to play within so that it's healthy and useful. We don't know this, but the only way to, the only way to get there is to work through it. This is going to take a generation. For example, my kids will use social media. There will be a, I never got hooked on and never had any problems with it whatsoever, but I've seen what has happened. So I'm going to raise my kids and I'm going to make sure that they understand how this all works so that they don't have, they don't suffer the same fate. That it's just, it's just how society works. It's how things sort of go. There's not much you can do unless you give the government ultimate power like they have in China to dictate exactly what you can see. But you and I know that's a huge problem. That's a massive, that's a much bigger issue. This is just one of those things where we have to find our way. We are still crawling. We have to figure out how to walk and then fight through this. So in my opinion, this is not really about what TikTok's doing to Americans. This is about the government taking more control and wanting control over social media. This is about, this is to me a, a much more about their censorship agenda than it is about, you know, doing what's right for Americans. There's a great quote from uh, Edward Wilson. And he said, the real problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technology. And that's definitely what we're seeing here. Cause it's just like, I don't even think we're, we're fit to deal with these sort of things. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a scary, scary, new, scary, new world, brave new world. Some might say that, uh, leads us into the European union passing the world's first major act to regulate artificial intelligence. The European Union approved regulations for AI on Wednesday, marking the world's first major set of governing rules. The regulations, known as the EU AI Act, received overwhelming support with 523 votes in favor, 46 against, and 49 abstentions. These regulations categorize 
categorize AI into different risk levels ranging from unacceptable to low hazard and are set to become into force by May with implementation beginning in 2025. The EU aims to strike balance between innovation and protecting fundamental rights through this legislation. So are they heading down a dark path or do other countries need to follow their lead? This is a really tough one um, because the potential for AI, what it can do, it goes way beyond anything we've ever had our hands on. Um, I don't love the idea of government regulation on anything. I don't. But as much as I hate to say this, I can't think of a better solution right now. I don't totally agree with their act. I don't think it's, I don't think they've hit the nail on the head by any means, but we do have to have some sort of unified understanding about this stuff because like, um, you know, those guys that did, um, not trigonometry, um, the guys that did the social dilemma, you know, they're, they're leading some charge right now about, um, just the ethical use of AI. And what they said was, this is like technology from 500 years from now. So it's like, we're in, you know, 2000, this is like something from 2,500. We have no idea how to manage this. Like you said, we don't know how to really manage social media. AI is on a totally different level that humans have no idea how to kind of not only wrap their head around where it's at now, but the pace with which it's going to grow and what it's capable of. Like they've got these autonomous AI drones that they're using. Like multiple countries have these now where there are like autonomous AI killer drones. I wrote about it several months ago. This is insane. Where they just send it an army of drones that have, they're autonomous. So they will decide whether or not they will kill something and they're charged by AI. Like that is so frightening. So, I mean, where this can go and the potential here is is pretty scary. I think there are a ton of benefits for AI. I think, um, you know, one of the other interesting things that you mentioned when we were talking the other day is, you know, is AI going to replace capitalism? You know, is this going to replace so many jobs that the current system we have in place just isn't going to work anymore? So when you look at it from that perspective, so AI can be a danger physically, but could also, if it does replace, you know, they said, from what I remember, 300 million jobs this year, up to a billion jobs next year. What's this look like in five years? Does it replace more than half of the workforce in the world? What does that do? How do, how do we manage that? How do, how, in, in a few ways, like obviously economically, how do you survive? You know what I mean? What's that look like? And then the other thing is like, how, what, Get what a is trades your, job? <laughs> yeah, well, what is your purpose in life too? And I'm not saying like, without your job, you don't have a purpose, but I could see society going down a pretty dark path at that time. So uh, as far as AI regulation goes, we need something in place. I don't think stifling its progress is the right answer. Um, and I don't exactly think that their act they put in place, it, like I said, hit the nail on the head, but we do need something. I'm more and more resigning myself to this fact. And it, it sounds a little bit black pillish, like un, unhopeful, nihilistic, but it's, I think it's just the reality of it's impossible to know where we're at. I think we're in what is called the singularity, which is a point where once you get past, you can't see any further. It's like, so we don't know what is on the other end of this. Once it gets to that point that right. you're talking about, it's impossible to forecast that we've, there's nothing to reference it to in history before where we've said this kind of technology or this kind of thing led to this change in society. Therefore we can model it to this. It's like, there is nothing. This is completely novel. And we're living in this hyper novel world where it's like the the technology is progressing at the point where we cannot as a species keep up with it at all and this where this is where it gets scary because then you go okay are we just going to end up integrating with this technology if it if it does get to the point where we can't control it to that degree with things like Neuralink and such and then even elon musk was making the prediction uh on twitter this week that by next year ai will be smarter than any single human on earth and that by 2029 he thinks it will be smarter than all of humanity combined and that's like, pretty concerning and then you're like okay well we get to that point you you can't even speculate on what that reality looks like just four years down the line because it's it's impossible for our hardware, our human limited brains, which in a, in a sense are amazing, but also at the same time, you know, like I, like I was pointing out, Paleolithic emotions, and we're we're essentially still got caveman brains, mm -hmm. and it's like you can't even you can't even make accurate predictions as to where this goes. Right. And I guess that's why, like, you do need some sort of regulation. And I just, you know, here's the reality, though. 
this may be here's my concern you let the government regulate it what's the government actually going to do the governments can use it to their benefit because you've got a group of people that have been elected to be in these positions most of them are completely unqualified to manage the day-to-day -day stuff that they have to deal with i'm not necessarily saying that other people are more qualified other people are more qualified but not like there is no preset qualification for this job but that's what makes it so hard you don't go to school to just be a politician and then start from a young age learning to do this you get people from all walks of life walking into this position what i mean by that is no one's prepared to deal with stuff like this so just being like, hey, government, who we know really only operate in their self-interest, why don't you guys manage the most powerful technology that has ever been seen by mankind? Yeah, you guys go ahead and deal with it. When we know that they always do what's best for them. My concern is they won't put the right um, safeguards on here. They won't because they'll use it to their benefit, to the detriment of society like they do with everything else, and it'll get out of control. So the way I think you actually have to do this is I think you need sort of a, an integrated body of both people that are in the tech sector and people that are in government and maybe people from other other industries where this because you know like you said ai is going to affect literally everything you may need a, a board of people from all different walks of life and all different industries um working together to sort of manage this and that, that's not like anything else we've had you know i think you're kind of looking at this sort of like un type group that's going to have to be much larger and from many many different walks of life both politics not politics business all this other stuff that are sort of working together on this one board to sort of manage and monitor this I, I don't really see any other better way which is scary because i absolutely hate the concept of the public and private sector collaborating i think those two things should be at direct odds with one another and constantly keeping each other in check but then yeah you look at things like this and you go i just can't think of any other possible solution and that's what's uh yeah that's what's uh scariest in in regards to this but then even on top of that too not even just replacing people's jobs but then you know we saw recently there was a report of over 70 percent of canadians want to leave their jobs yeah so you're like okay even if people keep their jobs they don't they won't really want them um and <sighs> And this is where, again, I go to this idea that, yeah, maybe maybe we are heading into this change of where capitalism can't operate. Uh, you know, if people if people can't afford to participate in the economy and buy goods and all of this kind of stuff, which we're seeing a, a vast increase in the amount of people that are defaulting on on mortgages on not being able to pay uh their mortgages falling behind on credit card debt and such and what's scary to me is that people are going to look at that opposite economic system communism and we're seeing these 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 companies put together a uh, a plan for a more socialist world with things like universal basic income and such and to me, I think this is one of those this is one of those areas in humanity's trajectory where we need to come up with a new idea because we can't superimpose old ideas, both that haven't that have worked well, like capitalism up until now, and communism, which has never fucking worked. But looking at we can't impart old ideas into this new world. So that's kind of an interesting thing you just said there. We are we are shifting more towards this time where capitalism is not going to work. So what's the alternative? It's kind of Marxism and communism. Do you think perhaps, because we're seeing this in a, in a big way in the Western world, do you think perhaps they understand where this technology is going and that they are pushing this this sort of UBI and communism and all this Marxism stuff? Do you think that they're pushing us there, knowing that AI is really going to be the catalyst that push, pushes us over the edge? Going And, and, and now, bear with me, but it's, I almost make the government sound benevolent when I say this. They go, if we keep capitalism in place the way it is, and AI takes over 50% of the jobs by, say, 2030, that is going to create absolute 100% pure chaos so do you think do you do you think that they understand where this is going and they're like hey look we don't have a better solution right now so at scale if we do not start implementing some sort of communist type operation when this when technology takes over and these people are not needed for their jobs anymore will there be any way to reel in society or will it just because because you know you know as well as i do if we go full chaos there's no putting that back in the bag that's not happening if this country starts killing each other and everybody's like everyone for themselves that's shit that's revolution type shit that's 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 a that's 10 to 20 years of wild chaos in society you know what i mean do you think that perhaps they know 
that AI might just be the thing that pushes us over the edge that says capitalism is not going to work. And that's why they are maybe pushing towards this. I've thought that for actually a very long time. And I've thought that they've been using climate change as a kind of bait and switch for the act for the reason that if you say we need to do all of these kind of things these economic changes in the name of climate change well we're trying to deal with a problem that is happening in the natural world whereas if you say you need to implement all of these policies because of the technological progress that is happening then people are a lot less likely to go along with it because this isn't something that's being imposed upon us it's something we're creating right and so i i do think there is is that that mentality to it you even go look at the leading thinkers for the world economic forum that are directly listed as agenda contributors for this whole this whole agenda 2030 which is uh noah yuval harari and he has made i i disdain this guy but he has made the argument that just like the industrial revolution created the proletariat aka the working class the fourth industrial revolution which is ai and bioengineering and so on that it's going to create a useless class uh of people that just have no have no ability to add uh to the current societal structure and his supposed solution to that is to distract them with video games and drugs and yeah. you go and you go fuck like okay is that is that the world we're headed towards we see these institutions praising things like these little pods that like these little livable pods that are like 10 foot by 10 foot and all this kind of stuff and you see these black mirror episodes and like i'm like oh fuck is that is that the world we're headed towards well here's what i will say if we find our way through this i think we will maybe enter the golden age of human life you know, like in a hundred years, <laughs> like I do, I do like, think about it. If, if we find a way through this, if we find a balance where people can actually spend time doing things they enjoy, um, you know, AI does most of the work in, in some fashion, you know, people, it's not so demanding and people can kind of live a more self-actualized life. It'd be pretty phenomenal. Um, however, it's how do we get there? And I think this is the start. And I think people need to maybe start kind of looking at it this way and paying attention and being like the next five to 10 years might be really rough. Because moving through, finding some way to integrate this technology, which you can't slow it down with society and what that means for the, the human race at large, I can see this going down a dark path for some time. I think it's going to be um, a lot of a lot of struggle before we get to that utopia, as I was as I was sort of suggesting. Rogan has an interesting perspective on it. I don't know if you've ever heard him talk about how it feels like humanity is a caterpillar building its own little cocoon here and we're going to become a but <laughs> <laughs> sounds so dumb to say but we're gonna we're gonna become a butterfly but, yeah, yeah i feel you but though. but it's like the point is is that caterpillar does not understand what it's doing it's doing it from biological instincts which is just progress at all costs what and we do. that's what we do and yeah that goes to that singularity aspect where once we hop in that cocoon it's like you don't know what's on the other end of it You're yeah that's interesting i actually think like now that i've that we've sort of discussed this and, and it that, that was that was the first time the idea of ai being the catalyst to push this end of capitalism that was the first time i really thought about that the way that i'm the way that i'm seeing this now i i i actually am now like sort of convinced that that is what they're doing and now I have a bit of a change of, of heart. I don't think it's necessarily a benevolent government. I'm glad I figured that out. <laughs> um, what I actually think it is, is the, the ruling class in the world that are sort of above and beyond your borders, that sort of dictate and control society and corporations and government, the ones that are above that. I'm wondering if they realize we're at this precipice that if they don't implement something now, that they are actually going to lose control. They are going to lose power because that chaos will be too much to control. So they may be working in conjunction with governments to do these things to sort of implement this, this new strategy so that there can be some peace when this all pops off. So that's actually kind of, yeah, that actually makes a lot more sense. I think that's where we're going. That's kind of dark. And I'm going to think about that a little more and maybe share some additional thoughts on it later. But for now, that's actually what this looks like. I think they're trying to keep their hand on the hand on the hand on the wheel yeah. and where, I mean, <laughs> 
we're literally entering entering a world where that wheel is going to drive itself but i think they're trying to keep their hand on it and yeah i who knows what lengths they'll go to in order to do that i don't think that necessarily makes them good i i look at it like i I look at it like they're trying to be the ones to say that i should carry the ring give me that ring of power yeah i agree with you i mean i think they're they're basically saying we know better let us do this what they really want is they want to keep control I actually believe that society would always find a way. We've done a good job of solving our own problems. That's why we're still here. So I do have a little more faith in humanity. But um, when you look at the sheer chaos that this could create, I don't know. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But yeah, I do. I do think. I do not think that they are being benevolent. I do think it is in their own self-interest. That being said, I'm not sure what a better solution is right now. Yeah, and I've said it. It can sound very dark because change and uncertainty is scary, whether it be on low levels or whether it be on a societal level. On the opposite end, though, to kind of, I I don't know. Maybe other people won't find as much solace in this as I do, (laughs) but like. I just, I do think it is genuinely interesting to be living in the time period of humanity that is a hundred percent the most interesting that there's ever been. There's like the span from 2020 to 2030 is going to be like the 10 year period in history books. If we, if we're still around <laughs> 200, 300, 400 years from now, they're going to be like, it was this 10 year period that shaped everything. Yes. I agree with you. I actually think it's interesting too, because like <clears throat> we never really know how long we're here for. We plan for a long time, but you never really know. But it makes it a lot more of an exciting ride when you're watching how this going through this turbulent time, you know? But I think that also is a certain type of person. You and I are willing to take control and take charge of our lives, and we don't mind the chaos. And, you know, we actually feel like we can stand up for ourselves and we can survive. We have that feeling. So I can imagine a lot of people that don't feel that way in the regular part of their life. This is going to be a very uncomfortable time. Yeah. And I, th- I, don't, I don't know how many people think like us. I don't know how many people are on the other side of it. But I could see there being two very different camps on this, you know. But I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm, I'm on the same page as you. I think it'll be interesting. And hey, it'll make for a hell of a ride. All right. Well, don't forget to head over to our website to sign up for our newsletter, blendernews.com. That's B-L-E-N-D-R news.com. And we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody.